Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel of speakers, Dr. Arturo Ragascas. He came here from the University of Tennessee. He is working at Oak Ridge Labs as chair of the biorefinery, and he has been working, prior to that, he worked in Georgia Tech University, and his major research on biomass, biorefinery, and biofuel applications. Uh, we are really happy that he, uh, he took his, his to come to visit us in here in his busy time. And I hope he had, uh, he had different meetings and yeah. he enjoyed these meetings. Absolutely. And uh, we, we love to hear about his recent research and what he's doing. He mentioned that it's a little technical, but most people that have been around the room, they know about biomass and should be okay. And I uh, eagerly look forward to looking, his, uh, listening to his talk. And uh, again, thank you so much for yeah, coming. It's a Please real pleasure. Me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, thanks for having me up here. Thanks for having me after the snow melt. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a talk a little bit about some of our work on uh, biorefining. <laughs> but even today we talked a lot about, you know, what's the future hold? And you can get fuzzy wuzzy and many people have different opinions. But in reality, the future of mankind is almost baked into the cake. Um, one of the things I like to do, and this is why I have this picture of trees, especially when I go to uh, Europe, you can go to those natural science museums, and they all have one, one presentation that almost every museum has. They have some big tree, and then they mark, on the, you know, they get it carbon dated, they mark, you know, Columbus lands in America, Declaration of Independence, Man on the Moon, unfortunately the nasty things like the Civil War, and you have World War I, and you have World War II, and the Korean War. So you can ask, though, what will that little wheat, little uh, wee pine tree tell us of the future? What will its rings mark? And as I said, I think you can almost predict what those rings will be. In part, I think we're seven, the population, we're roughly about seven billion. We're going to go somewhere between nine to ten. And that population growth will dictate a lot of other things. One, you're going to see a continued growth of what they call mega or meta, meta uh, cities, which will be energy intensive and resource intensive and put more people on the planet in little areas than we've ever had uh, historically. There is a globaliz uh, growing globalization of the middle class. We do, the last two years I haven't done as much, but I've done a lot of con uh, consulting in the Middle East usually on biorefining issues. And I remember the first time I went to China, flew into the old Beijing airport, there was a lady with a corn, uh, corn straw broom sweeping the runway. And you benchmark that to what you see in China now, and it's unbelievable the growth they've had. And there's a tremendous amount of middle class growth that, that has happened, at least on the coastal areas of China. And I see that in various other places in the Middle East. And, the, and unfortunately, as, as I testify to it, the whole human population is aging, uh, especially in North America and especially in uh, Europe. And that's going to dictate consumer trends. It's going to dictate spending trends. It's going to dictate what society wants to some extent. <clears throat> and all of this, uh, as we get greater and greater populations that demands more and more resources, society as a whole is going to value the environment much more. You can see those trends even today. Uh, the next one, it all depends what part of the political spectrum you're on, but at least in my case, uh, you, you have to say the climate is certainly changing from a personal experience. We could argue as to why later on. The advances in biotechnology are so rapid that it's allowing us to customize a variety of living systems. It'll impact uh, medical systems, but it'll also pick, impact ag and other things. And in all of this, there's going to be a race for resources. We're almost going to go back to the 60s where we're going to be resource limited in a variety of things. So uh, what drives our research, especially let's say in resources for biofuels, and I'm largely here too, I'm saying, was this Energy Independence Security Act. We almost all know this. Uh, during President Bush, Congress passed a rule that said we were going to get roughly almost 35 billion gallons of gasoline a year, half was going to come from corn, half was going to come from cellulose uh, ethanol, and advanced biofuels. 
The corn part came on even faster than anybody thought it would. The corn part would like to even grow larger than most people have that's mandated in this rule. And if you do know anything in cellulosic ethanol, you know the cellulosic ethanol part has really not even has dramatically lagged behind. Now, part of that you could argue is the recession in 2008, 2009 really pulled back a lot of resources that would have been needed for capital investments. A collapse in oil prices has, has questioned some of the uh, technologies that were developed that were viable at 130, 140 bucks a barrel that are not really viable at 50 or 60, maybe at 80. So you could, you could wonder what is the role of cellulosic ethanol, but what I, I tell my starting students is, look, if you travel the world, there are only a couple places in the world where people don't care about biofuels parts of the Middle East, parts of Russia, but most of the rest of the world has some kind of mandates on a renewable fuel portfolio. <clears throat> so this will only grow further in the future. Uh, as societies implement it, either for energy security, for climate change, for the environment, for rural development, uh, for utilization of conversion of uh, municipal waste, into something that you don't have to landfill. There's a variety of drivers in different parts of the world that will drive the interest in biofuels. So my career in biofuels really started September the, I should have put 20, uh, 2007, I apologize. Um, we had spent a year uh, writing that proposal and um, we had submitted, and I was in, I was in, I was in Portugal and the Great Lakes Center was announced that it was funded. And I remember scouring the web to see anything about Bioenergy Science Center. I could find nothing. And I was about to go on Portugal and get, now they're taping me, totally trashed, because I thought we hadn't gotten funded. And a dear friend of mine, who knows me too well, phones me up and says, Art, don't worry, we're funded. We're just on a news blackout. You're going to have to wait. I, so I went out in Portugal with a much greater, better demeanor and went to the bars. And then we, uh, the renewal was 2012, and then um, there was that call for proposals last year, and we are now part of the Center for Bioenergy Innovation. So really from about 2007, a large portfolio of our work has been on, <coughs> excuse me, the recalcitrance of biomass and understanding it, especially in BESC and partially to CBI. There's this focus on overcoming recalcitrance to reduce the, the cost of converting biomass to simple sugars and subsequent fermentation. The argument in the best was if you could address this issue of recalcitrance, excuse me, you had, you had certainly uh, improvements in the cost of cellulose eth ethanol, you would have you know, rural employment, expanded markets, but you could also get into chemicals and other materials by removing this recalcitrance factor. And that project was focused on three things. Developing uh, biomass that had reduced recalcitrance, either by, uh, well, primarily by genetically altering the, some of the polymers in the plant cell wall. And there was also the deconstruction team, uh, which was the deconstruction and conversion to ethanol. And finally, there was this enabling technology team. This was our home at that time, and we've kind of morphed into a, a comparable mole in, in uh, CBI. So in this team, they basically turned on and turned off genes and measured the changes in recalcitrance. And our task was to determine what changes have you done in the structure of the plant cell wall polymers. And the deconstruction team always had leftovers. You'd only convert so much of the material. Not everything went 100% to ethanol. So we looked at that biomass and tried to determine what is the structure of that material and why wasn't all the carbohydrates converted over to uh, uh, simple sugars are fermented to ethanol. And in some kinds, when they came very close, it had lignin, so we would look at the lignin for its structure and could we valorize it. So early in my career, mid-2000s, we did a lot of work with uh, one of the oil companies. And one of the th criticisms they had on biofuels, they said, you know, the success of our petroleum company is we know every molecule that's in an oil field. We know exactly the chemical constituents they have in the oil field. And we know what they are when we pull them out. We know what happens when we take them through shipping. And we know what happens in the refinery and to the customer. 
And they go, when we look at biofuels, you don't know what your starting material is, really. You don't have a poor conceived idea of what it is after pretreatment. And okay, you finally know what the sugars are, but you really don't know a lot about the overall thing. So we got, <laughs> so they argue, and I, it's an argument I think that holds true, is that we, we need that same fidelity of information. What is the exact structure of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and the pectins? And that's actually where my group plays in CBI and previously in BESC. We spend a tremendous amount of time understanding the structure of lignin, uh, cellulose, and the hemicelluloses, both in native or genetically transferred plants, uh, if, if that, and what happens after pretreatment, and what's left after a, a deconstruction process, either consolidated biomass processing or a conventional fermentation. Early part of my career, we did most of this at uh, Georgia Tech, and then 2014, we moved up to UT and Oak Ridge. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a rather long project that only recently formally uh, wrapped up. Uh, one, of the, one of the real pleasures of working in those energy centers is the, the multidisciplinary nature of the research itself, which is an area that I get tremendous intellectual satisfaction from, and so do my students. So Rick Dixon at Noble had shown early on in BESC that if you downrated, uh, uh, downregulated COMT, uh, you could end up with a plant that basically was, was as viable as growing as normal switchgrass, but it ended up giving 25% more ethanol. This is this Noble found, uh, Foundation transgenic switchgrass. So let me go through some of this quickly. <clears throat> Certainly showed the down regulation that the lignin content was decreased both by acetylbromide and thioacidolysis, and you had some changes in the H to the G to S ratios. Now, early in the days of BESC, we always had this belief if I downregulate lignin, you could change perhaps the structure of the hemicelluloses or the cellulose as more carbon is going through these shunts. But in, in reality, what you, uh, you'll see in a minute is that this is the control, this is the pretreated material, and these are the unpretreated. The transgenics always gave more uh, uh, sugar release than the controls, and this is the fermentation data, this is the fermentation for the controls, and this is the transgenics, and they always end up giving you more, uh, more ethanol also. So the question is as to why, okay, you have a decreased amount of lignin, but is that all it is? We had thought perhaps the crystallinity might be different because the plant is putting more biomass towards the cellulose, but when we isolated the cellulose and measured the crystallinity, really, there is no difference at all. And then you make the argument perhaps the DP is shorter, so I have more reducing ends so I can hydrolyze it quicker. Well, darn it. You know, here the difference is beyond the error bars. Actually, the DP is a little longer, so you can... It really, it's not a cellulose play. That's the bottom line. We looked at the hemis, perhaps the hemis themselves change, and given you having a 25% increase in sugar release, we just felt that these little differences in sugars, you know, 0.5 and 0 0.7, 0 0.16 and 0.22, it's just not enough to explain those differences in sugar release patterns. So the question is, is it just the reduced content of lignin, or is it the structure itself of lignin? So then we isolated the lignins and then went through a whole portfolio of lignin characterization tools. One of the ones that we always love is take this phosphorylating agent, it phosphorylates free hydroxyl groups of lignin, and you get, uh, truthfully, a rel relatively simple uh, set of signals, an aliphatic hydroxyl group. That's the side chain. C5 and syringal, guaiacyl, parahydroxy, and acid groups. Between the control and the transgenics, the total amount of phenolics was almost the same. But the, for example, we had differences in the free, uh, free parahydroxy phenolics, they decreased. We had an increase in the guaiacyl. If you're down regulating COMT, that makes sense. Uh, condensed fives didn't change much, and we also saw a reduction in the, in the uh, syringal phenolics, which is consistent with the genetic manipulation. <laughs> Having access to our own uh, in, uh, NMR instrumentation, we also, of course, characterize these by uh, C13 NMR and HSQC. First, we saw that with all the uh, 
the uh, three transgenics, there was no significant uh, variations in the beta or ether linkages, but certainly they decrease, there was a decrease in the transgenics compared uh, to the controls. There was an increase in the dibenzodioxazines. Overall, the transgenics had less carbon-carbon interunit, uh, carbon-oxygen interlinkages and more carbon-carbon linkages. And let's see, the resonol units were detected, but there was a slight decrease in the absorbed trans, uh, detecting the, there was a slight decrease for the transgenics. Now, all these samples, and I can go through some more examples. They had a decrease in the S, decrease in the H, an increase in G, which is what you expect. And the transgenics had a decrease in the paracumeric fluoric acids, which we argue in the publication was suggesting you have less uh, indirect uh, proof that you might have less lignin carbohydrate complexes, so it's easier to hydrolyze enzymatically. Uh, and we, and we, we ended up publishing that. <coughs> but this, this was the nightmare part of my project. I was truthfully petrified of this part of the project. All that data I showed you, and we had replicates and everything, was all from greenhouse plants. And well, clearly, you're not going to have a cellulosic ethanol from greenhouse plants. You've got to do it in the field. And it was also one of the deliverables for BESC was to take this technology out of the greenhouse and put it into the field. But, you know, as a, how do I say, as a, initially a wood chemist, maybe a biomass chemist, and you see these, you, these differences, significant but not, that, not, not a twofold or threefold difference. And then all of a sudden, these nicely controlled plants that are grown where I control the water, and I control the soil, and I control the light, and I stick it in a field where I don't have good control of light, and I don't have great control of soil, and I don't have great control of water, well, those variations get wiped out when I go to field studies. So certainly, it, it was shown in those publications that the reduced recalcitrance that was noted in the... Uh, in the greenhouse studies was replicated in the field. But our question was, will the variability of field-grown material wipe out any conclusions you can make on the wood chemistry, well, the, sorry, the biomass chemistry in comparison to what we saw in the uh, greenhouse studies? So what we had was we had there was a greenhouse study in 2010. They planted 2011, and we had access to the crop in 12 and 13. And the nice thing is Tennessee owns, University of Tennessee owns this island stuck on the Tennessee River. And it's surrounded by river on th almost on you know, four-fifths of it. So there's, you have really well-controlled road access in and out, so you don't have to worry about the seeds escaping. You don't have to worry about someone coming in and cutting it all down. So what we wanted to understand was what happens to the lignin uh, for these three-year field trials. And my student went crazy with PowerPoint slides. Uh, so just to walk you through what we did, okay, we took the ground, we took the uh, raw and the ground, bi ground the biomass. The extractors always give us problems in the NMR analysis, so we, we get rid of those through a toluene ethanol removal. We hollow cellulose pulp, isolate the cellulose, do an alkaline extraction to give us the hemis, uh, and this gives us molecular weight determinations by GPC for the cellulose and the hemicellulose. Uh, the lignin, we do ball milling, we isolate the lignin, and that gives us the lignin samples that we want for uh, GPC and HSQC. <coughs> Excuse me. And over the years, we've become a real big champion uh, that, that recalcitrant is basically controlled by cellulose accessibility. Uh, starting in BESC, I remember doing just consummate arguments that the, the issue that was controlling recalcitrance was the crystallinia cellulose. And eventually I showed myself wrong. And then we, we thought it was uh, either the hemicellulose or the lignin, but we, we came to realize that those were two simple arguments and too simple in understanding the plant cell wall. It's really the, the ultrastructure of the plant cell wall and how readily accessible is the cellulose in that structure, how easy can the enzymes get to it? So we use Simon stain as a measure of measuring uh, cellulose crystallinity in a fast screening type way. So again, we take the lignin, we get rid of the extractors, ball millet, treat it with cellulase, 
extract with dioxane, acetylate it for GPC, or take it down this way for HSQC. So this was some of our first data that we had on year two and year three samples. Uh, and these are sugar profiles. The pink are the control, the green are the transgenic. The first good news is this is more or less what we saw in the greenhouse samples for biomass constituents. We had an elevation of cellulose, excuse me. And of course, you have to, since you're downregulating the COMT, you want reduced amounts of uh, lignin. And some of the sugars, the xylane increases, and more or less what we had seen initially on our greenhouse samples. Uh, we measured uh, enzymatic digestibility for hydrothermal pretreated biomass, both for the, uh, the, the control and the transgenics for years two and three. And again, we get more sugar release for the transgenic plant. So hallelujah, everything's holding, holding still together. And we see the same thing for the unpretreated, same thing. You know, we get more sugar release for the, uh, for the transgenics and the control. Um, we certainly saw that as you had a, uh, a decrease in lignin content, total sugar release increased. And I mean, now many people have downregulated lignin. You can always see if you reduce the lignin content, you, get a, you can get an increase in sugar release. But we've always asked the question, is, is it just simply the total amount of lignin or is, it, is there structural features to lignin as you decrease that could be playing a more important role? So we looked at accessibility uh, using, uh, uh, this is the direct orange dye from the Simon Stain. And we, this is the year two control, this is the year two transgenic. And we have greater accessibility as measured by the dye and the transgenic, and we see the same thing for year three. Uh, and you, we can get, to some extent, a correlation between the accessibility and the uh, sugar release. And the, this, here's the structure itself of the, the orange dye. It's about 36 nanometers in diameter, so it kind of replicates cellulase. And it has a binding affinity towards uh, cellulose itself. So then we, you know, then we go through and we measure sugar release and crystallinous cellulose. There is really nothing there to be seen. It's the same thing we saw in the greenhouse. Uh, DP, really, it's a lousy number. There's really nothing to claim there. And xylose release and um, uh, hemicellulose molecular weights, there was just, there was no correlation. This is exactly what we saw in the greenhouse studies, that really there wasn't a good correlation between the changes in the uh, chemical features of the structure of cellulose or hemicellulose. This is strictly a lignin play. Um, <coughs> we did not, but there are differences, let's say, between the greenhouse and the control for year one, year two, and year three. In the molecular weights of lignin, the molecular weights of lignin actually increase in the, uh, the year, let's say, the year three species. And if you actually look hard in the literature, You'll actually find some data showing that as the plants become more mature after that first year of growth, it has been reported before the molecular weights increase. So then I have to tell you that uh, my supervisor in graduate, uh, graduate studies was Jake Stuthers. He, he, at the time, he was a leader in C13 NMR, and his bias on using NMR was imprinted in my brain. And we, we love the data we get from that. So we utilize uh, HSQC spectrum at, and uh, C13 NMR to get to the structure of lignin. We can certainly get to the uh, S to the G, the parahydroxyl ratios. We look for the paracumerates and the folates. And it's known that uh, switchgrass has got some tricin. And we can capture all these values from the isolated lignin samples. And I won't go through all the integrations, but we, what, what do we see in summary? Certainly the COMTs, the S to G ratio is decreased, which is what uh, you could say if you have more G, that lignin's got to be more cross-linked, so it won't take as large a surface area when it's pl placed on the surface of the polysaccharides. 
We have a reduced amount of paracumarates and ferrolates, uh, which could lead to lower lignin deposition levels and lead to less cross-linking between lignin carbohydrates, which should make it easier for the enzyme to deconstruct the biomass. So uh, our belief is those are some of the primary, uh, darn it, come back up, I'm sorry. There we go. <clears throat> you might re-mention, I went through it quickly, but in the uh, greenhouse studies, we had, let's say, the conventional amount of beta oil ethers, but the transgenics had lower amounts, and this is exactly what we see in the, uh, in the transgenics for the field-grown material. This, you have no idea how scared I was of this data. I was so worried that the variability or the significance would be all over the place, and the conclusion then is variability is too high for us to detect it by the techniques we use. But it actually validated the greenhouse studies and shown that we can actually go to field studies and, and show exactly what's happening. This is a bit of a map, uh, the side chain linkages, the beta 04s, the beta 5s, and the 5 5s for greenhouse field year one, year two, and year three. Um, and we certainly had about 20, 10 to 20 percent higher beta 5 units in the comp T ones and less 5 5 linkages. We could measure the benzodioxins, which we only saw in the, in the transgenics. And uh, there were some increases in, in field years, years two and three for, for reasons, truthfully, we still don't know why. And we don't know if it's significant or not. Certainly, the lignin molecular weights were negatively correlated with the S to G ratio. And our, our belief in that is because we do most of our molecular weights by, uh, by GPC, where you're really measuring the volume of the material that tumbles through the uh, GPC column. And as it gets more cross-linked, it it, it's, it's more spherical in structure. It'll, it'll go through quicker. And we looked at these tricin levels, which were present only in small amounts. But if you look in the literature, it's, 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 there are arguments that can be a source for uh, nucleation of lignin polymerization. And uh, we saw certainly changes in the transgenics. The amounts dropped down uh, from years one, two, and three. <laughs> and there was a correlation between the trinsing levels and the molecular weight of lignin uh, that, that we actually wasn't too bad for the COM-T. And this supports this idea of nucleation fu uh, function of, of tricin in the uh, lignification process. So what are we left with? We Actually, I think we just finished this. Time goes by so quickly. Probably last fall. And... Uh, we actually, I left quite pleased because this was a seven-year project to go from uh, from uh, field uh, from uh, greenhouse to field. Certainly, reduced recalcitrance is related to the reduction of lignin uh, content, but it's also due to an increase in accessibility, and we have these reduces in S to G, paracumate, and ferroic acids. There is little or no contribution to cellulose crystallinity or uh, hemicellulosis for these plants. This increase in molecular weight uh, together with lignin content causes in the seasons a negatively correlated to S to G ratio. Uh, tricin decreased across the seasons, which is negatively correlated with the molecular weight support uh, and supports this tricin uh, nucleation for lignification. And both lignin structure and content and amounts influence biomass accessibility, which explains the reason why COM-T is more easier to deconstruct. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Uh, but we published that. When did we get that? Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, there's a host of people I have to thank. We truly love multidisciplinary research. So in that spirit, working in a team like BESC or now CBI is a real pleasure because we get to work with everybody from chem hardcore chemical engineers to computational people to plant science people to ag people, and we fit our chemistry really well in there. It takes your students to talk a different language than just, let's say, talking strictly chemical engineering or strictly chemistry. And you have to understand that different people's perspectives are equally important as yours because different disciplines look at this whole, this whole field differently. Now, for the last day and a half, uh, most of my discussions here have been on lignin, so I thought I'd throw a few slides in 
because I don't want to leave you with the impression that we are only a biomass characterization team. We actually do a lot more than that. Um, I had always, and I had passionately argued in BEST 1 and in BEST 2, that if you're making biofuels and your vision is to throw away 15 to 30 percent of your biomass because it's called lignin, and, or just burn it, from a sustainability perspective, this is unsatisfactory. And even from an economics perspective, this is unsatisfactory. <coughs> when the renewal for CBI came by, that proposal actually had a call for lignin valorization components in there. But I'll just talk a little in general of what we do. Actually, if you, there's a variety of uh, both European and uh, American programs that are targeted at making bio-based uh, composites or resins. One of the reasons we initially moved to Oak Ridge also was their incredible capabilities on, on carbon fibers and their pilot plant facilities. And we have, uh, we have efforts making uh, a variety of resins, especially from HEMIs. And we work with almost everybody across the planet for their lignin samples. And we had a strong relationship until recently with Coca-Cola, who was targeted at making this plant bottle. They use lignin as part of the thing to make uh, polyethylene terephthalate. And if you want to work in this field, there are a variety of challenges. One is just engineering the structure of the materials you have, the fundamentals of isolation and purification, in the sense that uh, you know, if I isolate cellulose, I have cellulose. And I can probably, I might be able to change the ultrastructure, maybe change the DP a little bit, but I don't have much other changes. If I isolate lignin, depending on the source and depending how I isolate it, I can really dramatically change the structure. So you have to be worried about how you isolate lignin. And I think we, as a community, we, we are really challenged on conversion chemistry, and we are also challenged just on environmental issues. Uh, when, we, when we came to Oak Ridge and started working with some of the people on the carbon fiber team, I was really amazed at how little chemistry has been established in the whole lignin to carbon fiber process. They, they, know the, they know the purity amounts, they know how the S to G ratios influence the physical properties, but actually how it actually undergoes formation of a carbon structure is really poorly understood. So we started this by doing a series of uh, solid state studies. This, this, is a, uh, this is the extruded lignin, this is the methoxy signal, this is the aromatic signal. And just getting samples from those pilot plant facilities, looking at how, how the lignin goes under condensation. We've, we've actually continued that. We just got a, uh, working with my colleague out at Texas AMU. We'll have a new project coming online on modification of lignin to lead to the next generation of carbon fibers. One of the, it's an old project, but we, we continue to get a mix of industrial and government funding is using lignin for polyurethanes. The other thing I love about this, and you know this also, is it's a, it's a great recruitment tool. Because, uh, you know, you take a little bit of modified lignin, you throw some isocyanates there, on the front bench and then, you know, uh, becoming students, you get this lignified material that foams out like crazy. Everybody loves looking at that stuff. It's great for recruitment purposes. But <laughs> we've, we've made polyurethanes with and without cellulose whiskers. We've incorporated cellulose back into the polyurethanes. You get additional strength properties. We've uh, initially did a lot of work on putting these alkyl chains on the side. But now our, uh, most of our research is looking at lignin fragmentation to tailor the molecular weights of the lignin so we don't have to do much side chain derivatization. We have a paper coming out today or tomorrow, ACS Sustainability, where we took softwood craft and organosolve self lignin, uh, dissolved it up, fractionated it, added an anti-solvent, you get an insoluble soluble unit, and we always find differences in structure of those different fractions. We have differences in molecular weights and differences in um, the functionality of those components as you select it, precipitate them out. And the beautiful thing is, you know, normally, I think one of the problems historically in people that worked in uh, lignin valorization, you took a craft lignin, you took a sulfate lignin, um, you took an organosolved lignin, and you, you just took that and tried to put it in the material application. 
But the molecular weights are blah, like this. The functional groups are all over the place. And trying to optimize physical properties when you have high molecular weight lignin, low molecular weight lignin, some fractions high in phenolics, some fractions low in phenolics, it was a bear. And I think the people that, you know, we're standing on the, on the shoulders of giants that did this before, that didn't do much fractionation and optimization, uh, optimize the materials, I fully salute them. But I now, I think as a community, many of us realize that I can get much tighter physical properties by controlling the molecular weights and the chemistry I have of those polymers if I do some kind of selective fractionation. Uh, the other thing we've done, uh, largely it was for fun, but it has practical applications. We took, we actually, we started this by just taking old-fashioned craft lignin, and we ran it through uh, Massa Muki Super Mass Collider. Basically, we use this to make nanofibrillated cellulose, okay? And it's, it's two stones turning counterclockwise to each other, and you set them at a negative distance, so if there's nothing in between, you grind the plates out. So basically, your student's got to stay there. He can't go get coffee and a hamburger because the machine will chew itself up. And normally what you do is you put cellulose in here, and it fibrillates the heck out of it. When we ended up passing uh, just craft precipitated lignin, and if you have enough passes, you can get it down to roughly the, you know, the 15 to 25 nanometer scale, a little spherical dots. And we had, in hindsight now, some foolish ideas that this might uh, change the functionality of lignin or might change molecular weights, but in reality it doesn't do anything. All the chemistry you had in the starting is the same as you have in the end, it's just you change the particle size. And if you, if, you, if you think about this from a commercial perspective, this actually has tremendous value. Because you, me, our students, when you want to make a composite and that darn lignin won't solubilize, you take paradioxane, you take DMSO, you mix it up and you rotavap it off or you pump it off. But nobody in the industry is ever going to do this. It's, a, it's, just, it's just, there's too much chemistry involved. And we've shown that we can take these nanoparticles and we get much better dispersion in the material. Instead of having micron deposits of lignin in a composite, we can get, I don't want to say uniform, but really extremely well uh, dispersed in a composite, and the physical properties are much better just because of the size dependency. So it's being, uh, and now there's, there's publications in using uh, nanolignin for antioxidants and tires. Um, I have a friend of mine over in Europe, and he's looking at the same thing. And it's a really, initially when he told me, I thought this is a crazy idea, that who, who would ever care? They're putting uh, small particles of lignin in, in uh, carpets. And I thought, you know, I really don't care what's in a carpet. And my dear friend said, yeah, I know you don't. First year capitalistic American who is always worried about cost. Uh, two though, he says, I know you don't because you just step on it with your shoes. You don't even take your shoes off. You can, talk, you can see I'm talking about someone that's either in, Scan it's in Scandinavia. But he says, I know you'd care if you still had young children. Because when those kids are half a year old to maybe two, two and a half, three, they travel on all four. They have their hands and their, and their feet. And it's been shown that the normal conventional antioxidants can transfer from the carpet into a mammalian system. So if you have lignin as an antioxidant, which we know it is, and it's well dispersed, it's, it's actually an attractive uh, commercial market to, be, to pursue. Um, the other thing we've done, and we've talked to certainly Chris, probably does this just as well as we do, is we certainly have a very active uh, program in pyrolysis of lignin. We've characterized exhaustively the structures you kind of make uh, during, uh, dependent upon temperature, heating rates. Um, the internet was fun, and we still do. It's an evolving project. Was, you know, the, I always ask the question, is there anything else you can do with lignin? And then I remember, sometimes on weekends, I just read articles that have got absolutely nothing to do with my field, and I enjoy seeing who's doing what. I would argue that 
at least 90% of that is entertainment factor, but doesn't leave. But every once in a while you see something and you go, God, I can really use that. So <coughs> you go back to 2008, 2010. I remember reading an article on, on Rhodococcus. And Rhodococcus frequently grows where, there, where there's oil deposits and it chews up aromatic hydrocarbons. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that's kind of like lignin. And we spent a large amount of time looking at uh, utilization of lignin as a carbon source for rhodococcus. Uh, and what it does is it grows, and if I take the, if, if rhodococcus is growing well, and I take the phosphorus out or the nitrogen out, it goes into this kind of stasis where uh, instead of growing, it just consumes the carbon still but makes fatty acids. You make lipids out of it. So um, we tried that with Kraft, and it kind of worked but didn't work well. But then when you do the experiments, you go, you know, doing this with craft is kind of goofy because most of that, you, you, your belt pH 7 with an organism, and that craft is just sitting on the bottom going, you know, the organism doesn't even know it's there almost because it's not soluble in water. We started fractionating the craft and got the low molecular weight, and indeed we could almost get to an oligenous stage where about 10% of its weight was, uh, was fats. And then we took that lignin and we treated it with oxygen and sodium hydroxide fragmented, it got more uh, carboxylic acid groups, more soluble in water. We actually got oligenous uh, conditions, so we had 15% by weight uh, lipids. Since then, we've had a project, and actually some of it came from it, was, 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 I think it was Chris, yeah, uh, where he gave us his uh, hydrogen peroxide treated lignin fractions, and they grew like crazy you know, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, rhodococcus. And we looked at different pretreatments and seen how different pretreatments can activate lignin. Uh, by this point, I had crossed paths with Joshua Wan in China. We wrote a DOE project where he proposed altering some of the uh, metabolic pathways in rhodococcus to have lacase or an oxidative agent present with the rhodococcus so it could fragment lignin and we did the characterization before and after. And since then, uh, in a subsequent proposal that we're currently working on, we're uh, re-engineering the pathways so we make uh, PHHs, so we're not make, now making polymers using lignin as a carbon source. Uh, so that, that's just been an absolute blast. And I mean, we've learned so much. And then, what else? I did, I left that and I figured, you know, by this time, I'm way overdue my talk. But I also didn't want to leave you with, a, with the impression that all we do is characterization of biomass and lignin. The other part we have a tremendous amount of fun and, and publish aggressively in is nanocellulose. Now, truthfully, that part of my program slowed down when we moved back up to UT. It was an issue of funding opportunities and just getting everything under control. Uh, but we've gone back. We, uh, we make nanofibrillated cellulose, which kind of looks like spaghetti in an SEM cellulose whiskers, or what's called CNC. We stick it in a variety of composites to look at strength properties. We have stuck it in xylene films for packaging and showing you have decreases in oxygen water transmission. And one of the things that is now coming back in our group is cross-linking the nanocellulose to get functionality you can't get in the absence of cross-linking. And we're really good at controlling the relative orientation of each nanocellulose component using directional freezing. And we can make highly porous materials. And one night when I was just reading nothing relevant to my field, came across some articles on artificial bone and bone templates. And what you really need is structured porous materials. And I thought, well, that's exactly what we do with nanocellulose. And we have a paper that's, we got to submit the reviews to carbohydrate polymer, where we cross-linked the nanocellulose, made this highly porous structure and seeded proteins on it and showed it could be used as a template for bone structures. And we have two other papers coming out this summer on that. So, I mean, that's, that's been a blast. And we have a tremendous amount of fun in that area. And I think with that, oh, this was my, okay, this is, this is now the second to last slide. Uh, when I moved from IPST over to Georgia Tech, because uh, the IPST rolled into Georgia Tech, this was about the third slide I had when I had to give a, a talk to chemistry department as to what I was going to do for the department and how I plan to seek tenure. And truthfully, it's actually held marvelously true to this day. 
We want to be leaders in polysaccharide lignin chemistry, and to do that, there's three things you, I think you have to play in. We're certainly, we're, we're really good at polysaccharide lignin depolymerization, and this leads to biofuels and bio-based chemicals. And then polysaccharide lignin modification from new materials. And if you're doing these two, what you find is the routine analytical techniques that we all learned in undergraduate and graduate days, yes, they work, but they don't work great. So you have to find some time to optimize those techniques. I mean, we <coughs> did a tremendous amount in TOF SIMS, and that, that's our tool of favor to use for uh, characterizing the surface of biomass. NMR, John Ralph has, has done work with DMSO. I think it's pyridine for a whole cell NMR. We had done some work with ionic liquids, but now moved on to HMPA to do whole cell NMR also. Uh, we use FTIR routine, FTI routinely, GPC, we've done some improvements. So we do some work on analytical tool development, tailor it to biomass samples. And uh, these are three pictures of the retreats from the Bioenergy Science Center that we've had over the years. There's uh, actually, I guess there's 10 of them now. And the CBIs will be this summer. And again, a whole lot of credit to a variety of people here who truthfully challenge us and make us think of science in different ways. And I think the one example that w was so illustrative of this is it took us two or three years to be able to get tough sims of the surface of biomass. And we were, we were so proud of what we had accomplished. And I remember presented that at one of these retreats. And the first question is, can you measure what's right underneath? And it's like... Damn, you've just taken away all our glory and honor. <laughs> but you know, actually, you know, if you take those, take those comments seriously, and I knew why they wanted that, well, then we went back and we, did, uh, uh, we used a, an oxygen gun and a blade of the surface and burned off the surface, and we could crawl about 10 nanometers underneath, get another top sims, crawl again, another top So we could actually get a, an image of the plant cell wall as you slowly ablated each surface and took a measurement and did it again. So their questions actually drive our science much further than we ever would have done as an individual. So to me, it's a real pleasure and honor to, to work in such a, you know, a collaborative, multidisciplinary center. It's, it's always been a blast. And I, as we were talking today, you know, I started as an assistant professor. I had two or three projects where I was PI. That grew. And now I don't have any projects that are single. Everything we do is collaborative across the nation, primarily sometimes in Europe, sometimes in the Far East. And I, mean, I, I think it's made our, the impact of our science better. And it's actually allowed us to formulate questions and research that we probably couldn't have formulated alone. So I thank you for your time and attention. I'm sorry I held you longer than I was supposed to, but I think that's all I got. Yes. I should have put more slides on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm intrigued by the, by the results you got in the, the COM-T. Uh, yeah. And so uh, I'm interested, so two questions related to that. So the first is, did you see any redistribution, or let me phrase that, is there any differences in how lignin is distributed within the plant cell wall in, in those uh, mutations or, or not? We don't know. We just don't know. And that's a really good question. Um, we have seen it now in, in two other cases, okay? Um, and, and Jerry Tuskinen has his, uh, uh, what is it called? Tension wood samples from Poplar, okay? Now, in soft woods, you get a plant dumps a pile of lignin. So in in, uh, in Poplar, it dumps a pile of cellulose, okay? So we went through the same blessed thing. First, we showed samples from there. There's a tremendous release of sugars. So we thought, okay, maybe because it grows fast, it's not as crystalline or short of DP. No, the DPs are the same or a little higher. All the things that we love, the tools we'd love to explain, doesn't work. So then we used a, a combination of top stems uh, techniques, and we showed that most of the lignin, which is normally kind of roughly distributed uniformly, you know, mm -hmm. it's all put in the corners of the cell wall. Not, not all, it's a lot, but the bulk of it is. So that, what it means is you have much greater accessibility to the cellulose. Now, the, the accessibility data here probably is a reflection, A, of less lignin, but could also be perhaps it, it's 
put in corners or so. But I, we just did, didn't have the time to look. Now the other problem, truthfully, experimentally, okay, uh, most of our Toph Sims work and even some other imaging work we've done, we always like the poplar. I can get a real nice clean transverse slice. So what's grass is just, it, it, just to cut it, to have a nice clean slice is not easy. In the end, where you have no resin, you know what I mean? Right. So the cutting is, it makes your life absolutely miserable versus the popper, which is absolutely so easy to do. So. Okay. And then a, a related question, it was interesting that you saw the, um, the S to G ratio, right? Go, I remember Greg said it went down in the comp. Right, so that, when you it, comp T down regularly, you're gonna have less S. Right, So the right. G has to go up. Right, and so that you know, increases the cross link, sort of. Right. And, and so it's kind of interesting that you still saw the lower, you know, the increased digestibility when one normally thinks about the increased cross link. So it really does point to that, just really it's lowering the link. Right? That's really what it. Well, I think it's, uh, okay, I, I, I agree with you, lowering the lignin content is, is a big play. But the fact that you have less potential cross links to the hemicellulose is because you have less uh, ferroic acid and cumeric acids, I think is, a, is also important. To what degree, I don't know. You know what I mean? I think partly is lowering lignin, partly it's structure. Um, you, you can't make a hand-waving argument as I have more G, the, the lignin is more spherical in structure. It won't take as much surface area, so I again, provide greater access to cellulose, but I, I, I don't have data to say that. Again, my greatest fear was the variability right. of field-grown material. Other so. questions? I have actually one related question uh -huh. here. Like, uh, you mentioned that after the genetically modified, you saw the lignin had more CC linkages that yeah. rather than either linkages. Did this uh, increase in CC linkages affect the, uh, basically, isolation of lignins and biofuel productions negatively? Did it, it wasn't more difficult to isolate the lignin in that conditions, or was it easier to separate the lignin from well, the okay, Since we're, up, we're basically isolating by a large dosage of cellulase, right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we're, yeah. we're collecting leftovers, right? Yeah, okay. Now, I should say it's not... It, it, wasn't in my presentation, but certainly we we always worry about uh, the cellulase isolation of lignin because it's known that cellulase binds to lignin, mm -hmm. and then could that complex actually make itself kind of apparent or mislead you in your analysis of lignin either by NMR or GPC? So a what we do is we always treat after that with proteinase to deconstruct the cellulase, so to speak, or fragment it. We always monitor by FB, FTIR looking for the CN bond shift, so we know there's not a, there's very little or no cellulase left when we analyze the lignin. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, you I actually, think, do you think that using enzyme would basically um, repolymerize lignin after no, separation? No, no, it doesn't. No. But I, I like I do know. I just recently got I reviewed a, a real lengthy paper in a great journal. And they, they didn't monitor cellulose presence at all. And you know, and they, they were looking at thermal properties and the rest. And I said, I, I ended up rejecting it. He says, You don't know how much cellulose you have there. And I went, it was so painful to do because the work was so nice, and so well defined, and just one iffy step up front. Yes. I have a short question for you. So, when you do the treatment with isolate, you need a second slice presentation. You make Zeta films. Yeah. Like Zeta films. So, you, just, you mentioned that when we do the with the wood cheese, or with powder, I don't know the size. Oh, the Zion, we had extracted Zion. Uh, it, was, it was a bird Zion, basically the one you buy from Harvard. Okay. Um, the truth of the real problem. The properties of the thiamine films is fantastic, especially when you reinforce. The real question, of, uh, I was over in Finland, the question of commercialization, because they're always focused on commercialization of words. Is where you're going to get the volumes you need? Not many people have a great answer for that. 
And what you need is there you want high DP time, right? Yeah. I mean you could you could say you could get it. Um, I think some. Is it, I don't think it's plywood. I know there's maybe it's veneer where they steam it and they get some of the xylenes out. But those are low DP xylenes are totally useless. You need a high. You need a really high DP xylene to do this. Now I have a visiting student right now who's looking at trying to do that by. Uh, Selective extraction with borates that is uh, complex two hydroxyl groups to pull it out. So we're going to see if that works. Um, but if you stick a little bit of nanocellulose in there, gosh, you get a beautiful thing. Strength properties go up, oxygen transmission goes down, water transmission goes down, everything you want. What about the uh, water? Uh, it it, it looks on the water and comes with having a lot of hydrogen bonds in yeah, it, well, it, I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't absorb water, it does, but those tendencies decrease once you add cellulose, because you know, every, you know as well as me that Thailand just loves cellulose, right? So if I have all these free hydroxyl groups, especially in nanofibrillated cellulose or cellulose whiskers, it just gloms onto it beautifully. I mean, we had, we had five or six papers so quickly, it was absolutely Everything worked. This question about the, uh, is it the supermass colloider? Yeah. I mean, so it seems like that would use a lot of energy, energy. Right? And right? And it also seems like that the material would be um, contaminated with, as you abrade the the grinders right. itself, it would end right. up in it as well. And I just wondering how they get around this problem. I mean, the latter question is a really good one. I never thought of it. We've never seen to have like a, a real big increase in ash or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, Nanofibrillated cellulose is a, fan is a fantastic material for uh, potential applications. But everybody knows it's really energy intensive, okay? So the first way was done by right here. They had this plug uh, feeder, with a, basically a ball and a spring behind it. And I have enough pressure to get back. You got a shot of cellulose out there. And the, the shear condition is just kind of fibrillated. And you have to do several patents. Um, those patents were issued somewhere in the 70s, um, but they relinquished them because it was too expensive. And they were actually trying to make a food supplement. You know, eat cellulose, don't gain weight, and that feel <laughs> um, Then it was picked up again with the prevalence of nanocellulose. There is a, uh, the, the energy cost from doing this when you push the blood back and it is high, you can use a uh, kind of a nano channel, it's got a pile of zeds in it, the shear can change that in those directions, you can delaminate fibers. But those have a real high tendency to plug. Uh, the, the discs don't have the plugging rate, but they can scale up. So the two ways of doing this is I move the disc for this ball and spring cut kind of thing. Uh, and then, now maybe about 10 years ago, I think it was the Japanese that came out and showed that if you take uh, cellulose and fiber and treat it with sodium chloride, and I think it's sodium chloride and something, you can do catalytic oxidation, especially on the six sites, so you have some hydroxyl groups, which provide a charge that allows for self-repulsion of the fibers. So then your the amount of energy required for refining with, let's say, the super water goes down. They all go down. Uh, the sweets that some work on cellulase, the energy goes down. So then you have cellulase for day. We did bryodate sulfonation for charge on. I mean, the, the problem with the oxidation steps is your costs go up. Now all of a sudden you, gotta, you have a, in that case, we can't dump spent pride in a river system. Oh, it was, I think it was from Temple. So you can't, more and more, you dump that stuff in the river system. So now you have chemical recovery technologies, you need environmental abatement technologies. So I think there's still a need, and that was one of, we have an idea that we put in that RPE open to reduce energy costs. Um, so they, they, there's no denying the energy costs, absolutely. Despite that, uh, throughout the planet, there's probably a 
about five uh, nanofibrillated pilot plant facilities that are going. The Japanese have published <coughs> some patents. They're sticking it in diapers uh, for adult incontinence. Uh, they claim there's enough value in that to the additional cost. Our, our approach to some of this is really to uh, largely look at medical applications. This is why I really like uh, artificial bone systems. There are other applications that really bear a much higher cost, unless they put it as a supplement for uh, or something. Um, but the costs have come down. You, could, you know, I, I argue that it, is, that it provides some uh, access to some markets of the interest. And, Humans, by their very nature, are really good at doing incremental improvements with time. They'll probably get down lower, you know. Uh, we have a series of proposals that are possible ideas to control those costs. And then you can play the normal games. There was a paper oh, eight years ago. Even with those costs, you know, most people use. So did we, uh, bridge craft, bridge pulp. Well, you can go to recycle, or you can go to waste stream. Go to ag fibers, those are all material side costs dropped that way. So there are different ways to control the cost. Do you have to use the laser powder pulp or dissolving pulp for perhaps? We've always used uh, bleach pulps. Um, the market on dissolving grades is a little bit more controlled. And I, I have students in the bleach grades all over the place in the world, so I can always get them to send me samples. Coming back to the antioxidant function in the carpet and yeah. so forth, I mean, there's a million places antioxidants are there. Absolutely. And I was just wondering, you know, so uh, if it's okay for babies to eat them indirectly, you know, how about food applications? Are they, uh, are they, uh, uh, you know, yeah. people worry about nanoparticles now, and so that's another sort of dimension. That uh, the thought of having malignant in my food just upsets my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, do you, do you I, eat salad? <laughs> <laughs> I had a researcher, because you know, in the old pulp and paper days, you know, 89 and 97, I had this old kind of chemical engineer research scientist in my group, from the Far East. He would take a pulp fiber after pulping or bleaching, take it and chew it. You go, yeah, gap of 28. <laughs> and you're, you go, okay, this is nonsense. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Absolute nonsense. But when you measured it, he was pretty darn close. It was disgusting. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't, I, I guess I was just asked to review a manuscript and using blaming for uh, an anti cancer drug, okay? Well, the other place I was thinking about was things like, you know, fuming you know, and lubricating oils, things like that. Lubricating oils, fine. But I worry about, I really do worry about food and healthcare. This, this guy had great data, but I have a friend of mine who works in the pharmaceutical industry. I asked him once this, he says, Art, I have to put anything on medical application. We have to know the exact structure. Right. I go, by definition, you don't know that. Like, yeah, but See, we eat food. <laughs> I know, I just, I, I just want to stay away from this. But <laughs> I have a student who, uh, who was collecting bio nanocellulose and liquid, liquid materials from suitable applications. And it was a small startup, but he squares by it. You know? uh, so I think there's a host of applications that we have. Both are startups and science people, absolutely. And, 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 and you know, if you go back, go back 15 years, go to SciFinder and search antioxidants for liquid. You got a couple of bugs. You go in the last five years, there's been a tremendous growth measuring the antioxidant capabilities of lignin and corn growth, the lignin source you get, how is it extracted, and, and structural features. So there's a variety of